So hello, I am Margot Hobbs, a professor of art history at Muhlenberg College and Women's Caucus for Art board member. As a feminist art historian and former WCA president, I'm honored and delighted to interview art historian Mary D. Garrod as part of the WCA Leadership Interview Project. Mary Garrod was the second president of the WCA from 1974 to 1976. She's an art historian specializing in Italian Renaissance and Baroque art who earned her PhD at Johns Hopkins, her MA at Harvard, and her BA at Newcomb College. She's an expert on the work of Artemisia Gentileschi and has written four books on the artist. The most recent published in 2020 by Reaction Books is Artemisia Gentileschi and Feminism in Early Modern Europe. With feminist art historian Norma Browdy, Dr. Garrett has edited three essential anthologies of feminist art historical writing, beginning with feminist, Feminism and Art History, Questioning the Litany, published in 1982. In their book, the, Fow the Power of Feminist Art, published in 1994, Dr. Garrett writes about the WCA's founding as well. Dr. Garrett is Professor Emerita at American University in Washington, DC, where she taught from 1964 to 2003. American University honored her and Dr. Browdy in 2010 with the inaugural Feminist Art History Conference, continuing the legacy, honoring the work of Norma Browdy and Mary D. Garrett. The conference has continued to be held. The seventh was held online this past September. And having presented there, I can say that it's a wonderful conference where scholars from undergraduate to senior faculty present groundbreaking work on feminist art history. Dr. Garrett has been recognized with the WCA Lifetime Achievement Award in 2005, the CAA Committee on Women in the Arts with Norma Browdy for their pioneering feminist scholarship in 2000, and the Virginia chapter of the National Organization of Women for Scholarly and Professional Contributions to the History of Women in the Arts, also with Norma Browdy. So welcome, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you, Margaret. I look forward to it as well. Okay. So um, our first question for today, the Women's Caucus for Art was founded on January 28th, 1972. What was the situation within CAA that the caucus intended to address? What were the circumstances that led to the caucus's creation at that particular moment? Well, um, the situation, first of all, was broader than CAA. The national women's movement uh, had got, was getting going really strong at that point. There was a groundswell of protest everywhere. The discovery that sex discrimination was literally everywhere we turned. Um, at that 1972 CAA meeting in San Francisco, women CAA members created a women's caucus. That was something happening in many professional associations at the time, we didn't invent the term, uh, uh, creating a caucus to address the concerns of women, in our case, women artists and art historians, the dominant membership of, of CAA at that time, and really more art historians than artists, I should say, uh, the concerns of uh, those who were taking up the feminist cause. Um, so, Miriam Shapiro, Judy Chicago, and Paula Harper came from CalArts, just fresh from CalArts. They had just, just created the now legendary Woman House. It was literally in January, still uh, up and running and being seen by people and making a, a national news. Uh, Mimi and Judy are well known for their creation of a Woman House. Uh, as, as the artists who taught in the feminist art program, created the program and taught in it. Paula Harper, as an art historian, was the one, it was her idea, and I want to put that on the record because uh, she's unfortunately deceased now, but she, and I knew her well, and she um, never got quite the credit she should have for that brilliant idea, and she taught at CalArts as well. Anyhow, I'm digressing a little bit because I wanted to say that they came into the CAA meeting. They managed to get a fairly large meeting space for, uh, during the, the, from CAA um, leadership. And so they held a meeting. And um, Paula, I remember telling us later, uh, this, somebody called some information desk to find out where this thing was being held. And some guy said, oh, the, the ladies are airing their grievances, I believe, <laughs> so-and-so room. Um, in fact, it was a large room. And in fact, it was packed. And Anne Sullivan Harris, who had been a feminist activist at Columbia, had spread the word among art historians, and so the, the crowd had, had gathered. 
I, I was there. I remember the excitement, and I remember Mimi in particular addressing the group uh, eloquently and passionately. I don't remember exactly what she said, but uh, I had never seen her in action before, I believe, that moment. Uh, so on the spot, a caucus was created, chaired by Ann Harris, who uh, became the, the sort of leader uh, because she had done a lot of the groundwork. And she went away with nothing more than a mailing list with names and addresses. That was the caucus. <laughs> it, it existed uh, as a mailing list. Um, 1972 was a critical year for women in art professions. It was the year that Sandy Nimzer founded the Feminist Art Journal, mm -hmm. uh, which came out monthly. Uh, a very important organ for spreading the word, people telling their stories, uh, articles, essays. I think I'm right in, in saying that the ripoff file was published uh, there, ripoff file created by Nancy Sparrow and Joyce Kozlov, to uh, people just gathering people's stories, uh, the, the ripoffs that they'd experienced in professional uh, exchanges. Um, thinking back on this, it seems uh, important to say that our concerns were interlocked. Women artists, art historians, journalists. Women artists wanted their work to be seen in galleries and museums. Women working in museums wanted uh, to show women's art. Women artists looked to women journalists and critics for recognition. And art historians started to write about women artists of the past and of the present. They began to interview living artists. Um, now, the art world probably has always worked this way. But the difference was that we were pitting ourselves against the establishment. Mm -hmm. We were asking to be included in that network of art uh, entities in the world. And the glue that held us together was feminism. Mm -hmm. So it was a very uh, exciting moment. It was a dynamic moment when we suddenly uh, became aware of the national scope of our concerns and the way that the art world played uh, a very important part in it. I think that the the, uh, actually, the Women's Caucus for Art was a late blooming organization because that was founded in 72. 1969, Women in Artists in Revolution had been protesting the exclusion of women from the Whitney Annual. Uh, 1970, Faith Ringo led a group called Women Students and Artists for Black Art Liberation. I have to read the words because it's, it's such a long acronym. 1971, a group called Women in the Arts uh, took aim at the at discrimination against women in museums. And in 1972, Women's Caucus for Art, uh, then called the Women's Caucus of the CAA, took on academic professions through the College Art Association. So um, to back to 72, and I'm just going to sort of round this out with a, one more very important event of that year, which was the Corcoran Conference of Women in, in the Visual Arts at the Corcoran School of Art in Washington, D.C., uh, a conference organized, it was the first national conference of any kind of women in the arts, uh, organized by seven Washington artists and art historians who protested that no women were included in that year's Corcoran Biennial, an important showing locally for, for artists. Uh, the Corcoran Conference stands out in many people's memories as a major con consciousness raising event. Uh, the emerging leaders, and they were literally just emerging at, uh, were, at that time, Mimi Shikpero, Judy Chicago, Linda Nochlin, who had just barely published her first important article, why had there been no great women artists, and June Wayne, the founder of the pioneering Tamarind, Litho Tamarind Lithography Workshop. And uh, June had uh, been teaching what she called the Joan of Art seminars to teach women how to navigate the sexist art world. Uh, it was at the Cochrane Conference, everybody remembers this, that a hitherto unknown Alice Neal, uh, oh, oh woman, right? we thought, oh woman then, uh, came and started showing a carousel of her slides and she would not stop. She, people kept trying to give her the hook and say, that your time is up, your time is up. And she would not show, stop showing her <laughs> slides. And so we all, uh, you know, became acquainted with um, some of the, the, the just, just beginning to be leaders really in, in the group. And I also uh, began to feel a sense of solidarity with the concerns of uh, people in our field across the country. Mm -hmm. That's great. And it's great context to hear about all of the other organizations that were also things were happening in 1972 and the years leading up to that. That's really helpful. And so I'm wondering then, was there an expectation that the caucus would exist over the long term? And um, no, not, not really. <laughs> not at first. Uh, we weren't in any way thinking of it as a stable, ongoing organization. Rather, we saw it as a, an instrument for, for affecting change, for bringing change. It was utilitarian. 
uh, at a historical moment, it turned out to be a historical moment. Uh, idealistically, probably, we expected it would no longer be needed when change finally <laughs> happened. We, we still, that hasn't happened yet entirely. So it's a, it's, there is still a need for these women's uh, in arts organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, but we very much lived in the moment and we addressed problems pragma pragmatically. We invented solutions to the problems that existed. Uh, Anne Harris had gathered some valuable statistics of the women in, in, in academic professions. Mm -hmm. uh, Norma Browdy and, and Meredith Johnson created the, the Women's Caucus job roster, mm -hmm. uh, paralleling the CAA's placement service, a separate placement service for women. And it, it was very effective at the time because uh, it was, uh, you know, people didn't know where to go to find women. And uh, we actually could supply uh, a lot of names and and uh, information. Uh, Norma then became the, the caucus's affirmative action officer, another title we just invented uh, to, um, you know, start to function uh, for us. Uh, the first surveys to track the status of women in art professions were initiated and conducted by members of the caucus, not by mm -hmm. CAA, mm -hmm. although they used them. Uh, the situation was not good, although half or more of art history students in universities and colleges and universities were female, female professors were very scarce, mm -hmm. clustered at the lower ranks. You know that already. Um, but under pressure, the CAA took the, on the responsibility of doing surveys of art professions. It eventually became uh, uh, the, the one of the tasks of the Committee on the Status of Women, which CAA created. Again, in that seminal year, germinal year, 1972, uh, it was, um, they were kind of forced to do it. And the, the committee was, always a little bit less, more conservative than the caucus, but it was there at least as a, hmm. a, a functional uh, committee to, to address these concerns. Then what happened was that, and I think this gets to the relationship with CAA. Uh, yeah, right, right. Along with that, um, the, the CAA forced the caucus out. Um, we were, they weren't comfortable with the kinds of things that we were demanding uh, you know, inclusion of women in ways that were, were shocking and sudden. It seemed to be the traditional leadership at the time. Uh, in 1973, they obliged us literally to incorporate as a separate organization, mm -hmm. which we then named Women's Caucus for Art. Uh, I will insert here also that it was Miriam Shapiro who came up with that name. I oh, remember good. that. The Women's Caucus for Art. And I always thought that was so, so typical of Mimi really uh, to Think of it not as uh, a caucus for women, the arts caucus for women, but women doing something for art. Yeah. You know, sort of the, 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 the John Kennedy thing, that's not what you can do for the CAA. A, a, ask what you can do for, that's not what CAA can do for you. I should put it that way and ask what you can do for CAA. <laughs> she was thinking already of the caucus as, as, as expanding the world of, of, of the, the art world of the CAA which I think is very important. At any rate, um, as I was the second president at the time that happened, we were asked to leave and I oversaw the incorporation, which finally happened, I think in 1974. Mm -hmm. um, I thought immediately that it was important to create a more formal structure for the organization. Uh, I, I created officers, you know, traditional secretary, vice president, secretary, and so on, and a national advisory board. And I very much depended on the national advisory board for advice mm -hmm. uh, because these were prom women prominent in, in art and art history fields across the country, experienced people and very committed feminists. And I, I drew on their uh, advice uh, extensively. Mm -hmm. Uh, and at that point, we began to envision a longer life for the organization. Mm -hmm. There turned out to be advantages in incorporating separately. Um, we could expand the membership beyond CAA, for one thing. Mm -hmm. And that's when we began to form regional chapters. I found I, I created a few in my time. And then Judy Brodsky came on as the third president. And by that time, they were just growing all over the country. So we had a lot of, of chapters. Uh, and we began to interact with other feminist organizations. Mm -hmm. There were so many, it's almost hard to start naming them. Um, so the, the relationship with CIA uh, was a complicated one. Um, I, I, write, I write about that relationship. I did write about it in two places. One was the uh, a chapter I wrote in The Power of Feminist Art, mm -hmm. which you mentioned in introducing me um, on networks and organizations. And I also wrote about it in my section of a chapter in Susan Ball's 
uh, history of the C College Art Association book called The Eye, the Hand, and the Mind. Um, so it, it, I sort of had gone into more detail on this subject, but uh, it's a complicated story, and I'll tell a little of it because I think it's important for the history of the caucus. Uh, we, the caucus, first asked the CAA to give us visible representation at the annual conference. We wanted regular sessions, just like every other mm -hmm. um, you know, professional art historian uh, did. They gave us instead a hospitality suite, which they call that, <laughs> and two noontime slots, which we had to cram, into which we had to cram a business meeting and three, three workshops. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, you know, kind of say, get in the closet, ladies, and we'll uh, <laughs> and leave us alone. Uh, over time, we, we fought and we turned this in this second rank status into regular WCA sessions that were held during regular CAA time slots. And then when the caucuses program outgrew that format, we began to hold a parallel conference. And you will know that history and it, it goes on from a certain point, and I'm not sure exactly when that point was, uh, but perhaps the records will, will show it. Um, we, we had a lot of agendas, the women who were working with through the caucus with CAA. We worked to get more women on the CAA board. In 1970, there was one woman on the board of 24 people. And by 1975, there were 11. So it was you know pretty much par uh, equal representation. Uh, many caucus women were elected to the board, and uh, through that channel, we introduced a lot of resolutions for change. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to fight to make the white male-dominated CAA respond to feminist issues. Mm -hmm. We fought to insist that its group insurance plan include pregnancy benefits. Mm -hmm. And we fought to change the discriminatory age limit in the author Kingsley Porter Prize for the best art bulletin article of the year. Uh, there was an age limit, and that did not allow for the untraditional career paths of women at the time. So we made that a, a 10 years after graduation, after the PhD or something like that. Right. Things like that that just weren't issues before, and suddenly they were. Uh, and uh, the CAA board meetings um, became high drama events. I, as, as both a member of the caucus, as president of the caucus, and then as a member of the board later, I can attest to this. Um, we, we caucus leaders slash board members, they were kind of an overlap there, would always gather the night before the uh, CAA board meeting. The board meetings took place three times a year. Mm -hmm. We would get together the night before, usually in Miriam Shapiro's loft, uh, to strategize and plan what we were going to do. So we'd show up the next meet day at the meeting, which was normally extremely decorous, very civilized, very polite. Uh, words were spoken quietly and, you know, step, not, things happened, but not uh, contentiously in any way. But we would, we would, we were obstreperous. We would pass notes to each other, obviously, <laughs> wink at each other and applaud when somebody said something good. And <laughs> very much to the annoyance of the, uh, uh, the refined male Brahmins, I would call them typically East Coast academics who mm -hmm. were um, not accustomed to this kind of uh, indecorous behavior. After the meetings, we would celebrate our victories, uh, go out to dinner, uh, or re-strategize if we had lost mm -hmm. a battle that day. But it, it was actually just a lot of fun. And it was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I say fun because we, our minds were so uh, focused on getting these things accomplished. We didn't look at it as uh, the goal was to have a good time. The goal was to do things. Uh, but around the edges, we managed to, um, to enjoy it quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. So the excitement and the intensity of what you were doing just just really comes across. And you touched on this, but I just want to um, ask the question anyway to see if there's anything you'd like to add. But um, about the fact that other CAA affiliate societies have their sessions and business meetings within the CAA annual conference, but the caucus holds a parallel conference. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, do you want to say any more about you know how and why that happened? Yeah. Uh, the the CAA leadership created the very concept of affiliated societies specifically to ward off the WCA, to ward <laughs> off our active activism. They, they, it was a kind of a, I mean, it, the notion of, of, of a professional association having affiliates is not unusual. You have, you know, uh, groups that are, might overlap in interest but are more specialized, like the East Asia Society of Artists, right. like that. Um, and the WCA. Um, 
well, to harden, to harden the wall between the WCA, I should say that we were, attend, the president could attend board meetings, but they couldn't vote. She couldn't vote. And the, the resolutions were always treated as coming from an outside group. Mm -hmm. We were very much perceived as an outside group. Uh, so to, to harden the wall between us, they invented the category of affiliated societies. Um, now, this made no sense for WCA with its disproportionately huge membership. It was mm. tre tremendously large. I think it was oh, over a thousand members and CAA was something like five to six thousand at the time. So it was a, a tremendously large part of the CAA. And we, by the way, were advocating for over half the CAA membership. We, it, was not, it was not just the women who belonged to the caucus, but the women who were being, uh, who benefited from our activity, whether they belonged or not. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, being labeled affiliate meant being ostracized from our own community. We felt very much the sting of, of exclusion because we had always, most of us who were activists were long-term CAA members. Mm -hmm. we, we thought of ourselves as part of this professional association. It was our world. And uh, it, it, just did, it felt so wrong to, to be you know, held, held apart. However, we proceeded to grow outside the CAA world. As I said earlier, the regional chapters were created and uh, more during Judy's presidency. Uh, and she, Judy Brodsky, reached out further when she became president to join forces with other feminist organizations. Uh, she created uh, the what's called the Coalition of Women's Arts Organizations mm -hmm. by Eloise Schottler and, and Joyce Aiken. And you can tell from its name that there already was so many, such a large number of women's arts organizations that they needed to be organized themselves. Uh, and it was during Judy's term that the idea for and the realization of the Honors Award ceremony was conceived. It actually took place in, in the incoming the term of the incoming president, Leanne Miller. But uh, it was a, a kind of a, a project in the bubbling before that. Mm -hmm. The first one, as you well know, took place at the White House, Jimmy Carter's White House. Um, and subsequently, of course, the award ceremonies have occurred at and during the CAA meetings or parallel mm -hmm. to them. Uh, I think it's important to emphasize that was a very important um, award ceremony with, you know, the very, now very famous artist, Jojo Keep was already famous, but uh, Isabel Bishop, um, Alice Neal became mm -hmm. famous around that time, I guess. And uh, um, I may be leaving some out, but, but at any rate, very, very well known women artists. But I, it's important also, I think, to, to stress that the award was not given by President Carter to these women. It was given by the women of WCA themselves right. to, their, to honor their own lineage, which uh, is the spirit of the award ceremony and today still. And I think it's one of the great achievements of the caucus to have sustained this very meaningful event for such a long time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and and focus on art history, as we're both art historians. Absolutely. And um, so, I want to point out that that two of the first feminist, two of the first feminist art historians, and the first two WCA presidents were you and Anne Sutherland Harris. And you were among the feminist scholars who transformed the discipline of art history. Could you talk about some of the important early work by by you and um, um, Anne and um, other WCA art historians, and how is it received within the CAA? Yes, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, first, I want to make clear how important the CAA was at that time for this, uh, this uh, business of feminist art history. CAA in those years was the big tent, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the annual conference before there were regional or subdisciplinary conferences anywhere, it was just a once a year conference where people in our field met. This was before there was an internet and before there were emails. It was where we gathered. Uh, it, it served, the annual meetings served not only as a job placement center, meeting place for networking and so forth, but critically as a forum for cutting edge scholarship. Mm -hmm. That's where papers were given that became articles that became well known in the field. Um, feminist art history, American feminist art history, I should say, in the U.S. was born in the crucible of WCA CAA interaction. That's where it all mm, sort of generated. 
Um, the Women's Caucus and the Marxist Caucus brought revolutionary change to traditional art history, which they you know, were sort of parallel at the time in the 70s. Both caucuses existed. We uh, fought to have sessions and, and all that, but we uh, did something really quite important. I think both groups, traditionally sessions, art historical sessions were framed by art historical categories, medieval art, Baroque art, 20th century art, so forth. Our sessions ask, ask social questions, questions that, uh, of course, led to the socialist um, uh, art history as well as the Marxist uh, branch of that. We asked social questions and demanded that art historians address them. Uh, the early 70s saw the enthusiastic integration of feminist topics in the regular CAA program. I, I, I mentioned that because I really didn't remember it that way. When I look back at the CAA programs, to see how very many of them were in so-called regular programs at first. Uh, Linda Nockland's famous session, Eroticism and Female Imagery in 19th Century Art, which became the major, her, her contribution to that became the unforgettable article where she showed the male model and holding a banana and all that. That was 72 a session, she had a CAA session, uh, and her very justly famous 1971 article, Why There Been No Great Women Artists, opened the way for a creative explosion in feminist art history. Much of that was simultaneous with Nachlin. Uh, it takes nothing away from the importance of that essay to point out that that wasn't the only thing going on at the time. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of feminist art history happening just about the same years. Um, Linda explained in that classic article why women artists weren't called great. Carol Duncan challenged the notion of greatness itself in a classic article, to me classic, called When Greatness is Just a Box of Wheaties. Right. <laughs> uh, you're calling out the patriarchal propaganda uh, that attaches to our notion of greatness. Uh, in another conference paper, Carol uh, exposed the patriarchal propaganda in 18th century French painting in an article called Happy Mothers and Other New Ideas in French Art. <laughs> that was 72, CAA 72. Alessandra Comini took on the myth of solitary male genius, juxtaposing the self-centered art of Edvard Munch with the universalism of Katie Kalvitz. Mm -hmm. um, and Norma Browdy, in a 1975 CAA paper called Degas' Misogyny, uh, she called out not Degas himself, she's been misunderstood in that, but his male contemporaries, the mm -hmm. real misogynists who pen that label on Degas. Mm -hmm. Uh, many of these papers were gathered in Nomis and my first volume of, of collected essays, Questioning the Litany of Feminism and Art History, 1982. They were pa basically papers from the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, we also included uh, another important breakthrough article by Pat Minardi on quilts as a feminist art form. Mm -hmm. And this was, of course, the beginning of scholarship on women artists, so the traditional women artists. We included from a Fox Hofrichter's first article on Judith Leister. And my own first Artemisia Gentileschi article mm -hmm. called Artemisia and Susanna, which began as a CAA paper, would later lead to the first of my, my books on Artemisia and absorption with her work for a lot of my life. Uh, Braddy's essay on Miriam Shapiro appeared in that first volume. But to return to Anne Harrison and the first uh, art historian president, Anne made her monumental major contribution in co-curating with Linda Nochlin the groundbreaking exhibition, Women Artists 1550 to 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an incredible feat of scholarship. I think not really uh, well understood by younger scholars today who benefit from the groundbreaking research that was done to create that show. Uh, the, scho the scholarly tools that those two classically trained art historians used to uncover and discover countless women artists and position them in art history was, I think, a, a, a something so important, we, we put it right up there on the pedestal. Uh, when the show opened in Los Angeles in 1976, the CAA held a reception and welcomed it. It was uh, still seen as part of us, so, you know, our sort of thing. But in the later 70s, as feminism expanded in the country and the world, there was resistance, there began to be resistance to feminist topics in the regular CAA program. And you see this if you look at the programs. In part, mm -hmm. uh, the WCA drained off the energy as our independent conference program began to grow. But among traditional art historians who chaired the conference programs and selected topics, chose topics, uh, there was clearly a backlash, a desire to, again, construct a kind of wall between regular art history and feminist art history. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell a personal story because it's a very good case in point. 
Um, Diane Russell, the uh, curator of graphic arts at the National Gallery, and I proposed a session for the 1978 CAA meeting, which we called Questioning the Litany, uh, which we were going to, which would, of course, include them as papers. Uh, the CAA board turned down our session at first because, as one board member explained, it did not represent what is presently, presently significant for the discipline. <laughs> this was well into feminist uh, active scholarship at that point, uh, it, but it kind of encapsulates the, the, this kind of uh, backlash feeling. But the resistance when it was out there beyond CAA, when Norma and I collected some of these essays that we, we took the title, Happy Diane and I were happy to uh, have that happen, and uh, used it for a collection of essays we wanted to publish, we tried some 15 publishers before mm -hmm. HarperCollins uh, took it, had wonderful editor Cass Canfield Jr., who, who saw the importance of what we did and, and championed it. But I tell that story to a lot of people who try to get published because you, you've got to keep at it, you've got to keep on. 15 is not enough, 16 might be the one, so uh, <laughs> uh, keep trying. Uh, well, that book, of course, went on to become a college course staple, and it's, it, I'll say it is still in print after 40 years. Yeah, so much for what's not relevant for the discipline. <laughs> Right, it's such an important book, and all yeah, all three anthologies are are phenomenal. Um, but but let me just say about them that what's phenomenal about them is how much scholarship there was, and the, what we did was to gather it uh, yep. in, a, in a way that made it usable. But but the the key fact here is that there was so much being written. Yeah, it's solid archival work, and it's it's work that I assign my students to read when they're writing their papers. Um, I assign it I assign it to my classes still. It's it's powerful, yeah. solid work. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, another question I have, the last question really is um, also something that, that we share um, as an art historian with uh, whose academic training didn't include leadership and management skills. What was the learning curve like when you took on the caucus presidency and how did your work with the caucus intersect with your academic career? Well, becoming president of a growing national organization, national organization with no prior management skills whatsoever was indeed a huge learning curve. Um, but I didn't think of it that way mm -hmm. because I felt like I was finally taking part in a grown up world. Uh, I think I experienced agency, real agency for the first time, a uh, significant agency, I should say, and it felt like power. Mm -hmm. uh, it really felt like power and, and it was, I suppose, in a sense. But I remember uh, Annie Shaver Crandall, another WCA president, who was following me and several uh, others, uh, liked to quote me as saying something I didn't remember saying even. But she said that I had said to her, it felt like walking in seven league boots. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I think that means something to anybody who's had played this role. And perhaps that signifies for you, too, this sudden mm -hmm. sense that you, you can do something. Yeah, You're able to actually do something. Um, I think it was particularly true of, of my generation, perhaps more than subsequent ones, because we were we were we grew up school to be good girls, passive and powerless. It was it was the normal condition of women, uh, unless you really sort of took charge of things. But suddenly, we, so many of us found ourselves taking active charge of our own lives committing ourselves furthermore to a cause that empowered us. Mm -hmm. It made us feel that we could do something in the world and something important. Um, so that sense of agency, I think, uh, enabled me, certainly when I was president, to, um, to act in a way that felt, I suddenly felt the freedom to invent things. Uh, not just me. I mean, we were all, as I said earlier, inventing our agendas as we went along, uh, creating the, you know, projects for ourselves um, and, and to act on a larger stage. And all that was really very important to us. Uh, I should say at the same time about that, however, that um, it was professionally risky for women to be openly feminist in their academic uh, careers. Uh, women, many women that I heard about were tainted by feminism, turned down for jobs uh, that they were well qualified for because of this. Um, I personally was lucky in already having a job when this came along. And by the time, by the 70s, I was, I was tenured. So I had nothing to risk there. 
And I would say also that American University was unusually open to feminist activity among uh, schools that we heard about at the time. Uh, they, as it turned out, as it happened in those years, the provost, the dean of the college, and senior colleagues were female. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, one of those flukes of, of uh, and so they were very supportive of Norma's and my work, for example. Uh, and AU has always been a socially activist university and aspiring to be, you know, ranked a little higher maybe than they were. They were actually proud of our, our work and an achievement <laughs> in, a, in a way that uh, other, other colleagues in other schools had, had did not have that experience. Uh, and the other thing about uh, you say, how does these things, how did the work with the caucus intersect with my career? Well, I brought my activism straight into the classroom yeah. uh, and having been you know, in touch with uh, so much that was going on in the country at the time, I created a uh, women in art course right away uh, as soon as I could. And I introduced what turned out to be one of the first women in art courses in the country. And again, I was not unique, but I was very happy to be a uh, creating that too, and we, 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 uh, this was long before. These women in art courses that art historians introduced uh, were a, an important uh, contribution to the larger effort of discovering women artists mm -hmm. more widely. And then Judy Chicago's uh, the, the dinner party, uh, which drew on research that had already been done by feminist scholars and but then they, her, her, her researchers went even farther and dug up even more but that was part of a very mm -hmm. huge effort to, uh, to, to discover, to recover that, mm -hmm. that past. Mm -hmm. that's, that's wonderful. Um, I love that you brought the activism, brought the feminism into the classroom and that's where it's just taken root and, and flourished um, since then, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It, we have to, yeah, I mean, if I remind you uh, listeners of the, uh, the, the the horror stories of the old days, it's, it's really to, so that we can take stock of how far we've come. I, I remember when I first uh, wanted to teach that woman in art, women in art course, and I approached my department chair, who was a woman, as a matter of fact, and I said, I want to do this. And she said, but what would you do all semester? And indeed, she wasn't wrong because she had no, she was an artist for herself, but she had no idea of her own history. Right, right, right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mary. This has been an absolute pleasure. It's been a pleasure.